Welcome to this talk, and uh, this is going to be a, about GSM. I know that uh, some of you have actually quite some knowledge in GSM, so for you it might have been not so interesting, but uh, I think it's still important to a little bit raise awareness about how the security of GSM, uh, what the status of GSM security is right now. So as Dean had already introduced me, I'm Domi Tomchani, and um, let's begin. So what exactly happened with GSM? That's, uh, that's the question what people who, not, who are not really familiar with the situation would ask. And, um, and what exactly happened is um, Carson Knoll is one of the uh, German guys who is really well known for GSM research. And he started this research quite some time ago and was uh, going forward uh, with his team together to actually break GSM. And um, in the beginning, we didn't know anything about GSM security because this whole system was based on security by obscurity, which means we're not going to tell you how it works, so it's safe. And, um, and then later, there is uh, actually a quite a twist in the story when uh, one of the, I think one security researcher actually found an envelope containing information about the algorithm. And then uh, they started to look at it, and it turned out to be right. I'm not sure if, if that's the correct story, but something, was, uh, something similar happened with GSM. And then um, people started looking at GSM to figure out if it's actually, sec actually secure or not. But they faced a lot of challenges. Naturally, there were no hardware available only for, um, just for, for quite expensive uh, prices. And there was also no, no knowledge of what, you, what, what, what there is. So then um, in 2010, using a USRP, which is a software-defined radio platform, uh, it was possible to sniff downlink data and then uh, use a program called Kraken and two terabytes of uh, rainbow tables to crack, um, crack a live data, get, uh, which, which uh, Karsten actually sniffed from the air. And then the whole organization behind GSM called GSMA stepped up and said, all right, well, you actually achieved this and this is quite cool, but uh, let's say that uh, we turn, we, most of the operators use frequency hopping and the USRP cannot follow those frequency hops, so it's a secure system. Well, um, that's actually already a bad idea to say because uh, frequency hopping is only to avoid uh, interference with other uh, radio protocols and not for security measures, but the GSMA thought that would be a great thing to say that we have frequency hopping that is also good for security. So then a year later, uh, Osmocom BB came into the play, which is a platform for, uh, actually it's a software platform for such old uh, Motorola phones. and. Um, it's actually a whole a complete firmware for the baseband processor of the phone. And then Carson all together with Sylvain Munaud was able to uh, create such a firmware for, uh, for these phones that was capable of sniffing both downlink and uplink. And also because it has, uh, uh, because it's actually a phone, it had the radio capabilities to follow the hopping sequence, making, uh, making uh, frequency hopping cells uh, vulnerable to sniffing. But as you can see, I put two notes next to these two uh, kind of big events of GSM, what I consider big events of, in the life of GSM. In 2010, with the USRP, the code was actually released, and it's called AirProbe, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's still available for everyone. And in 2011, the Osmocom BB code was not released naturally because that was actually, if that code have, would have been released, then anyone with this phone would be able to sniff, the, sniff on these networks. And that, uh, that wouldn't comply the uh, uh, responsible disclosure uh, rules, I would say. So why did I choose to talk about GSM and why, why did I choose to actually uh, bring it here on the table? Because one thing is I think that GSM is broken and we already know this for, for many, many years. First we knew it in theory and now we know it actually in practice too. So I think that people need to know about this and uh, we need to get the word out, there, word out to them. And I thought that, um, that uh, the best way to tell everyone about how badly and poorly GSM is secured is to actually let people in, to come in and, and be able to play with GSM 
for a quite a cheap price and then uh, exper experience how it works, see all the data that flows through and uh, figure out some things on their own. So they then they will be able to to see it with their own eyes how bad it is. And um, and I put this, uh, it's kind of a, an idea to, to put a, a parallel with, with Wi-Fi and web. So as, as web cracking became mainstream, as, as people would say so, YouTube videos appeared and stuff like that. So like all the script kiddies are able to crack web these days and even they were able like five years ago. That actually put a, f a little bit of pressure on the IEEE to push WPA, WPA and WPA2 forward and make more people uh, conscious about uh, securing their wireless networks. And that's also, I think, uh, why in Germany it's illegal to operate a, a Wi-Fi network with, with a weak encryption. And, and, and open networks are also um, not allowed, as far as I know. But uh, to get the word out to people, they need to be able to, and, and let them to experience these things. I think uh, what, what they need is, is easily accessible tools. And sadly, uh, even though GSM security is quite bad, the tools to actually uh, uh, look at this security are still quite complex and, it's, and they are not so easy to use. So I started out with the USRP approach because for that we have code and and we and we have, and when we have the code it's it sounds like it might have been an easier approach than going to the Osmocom uh, BB project but the USRP costs a lot so is there any other solution and fortunately there is it's called RTL SDR who is the savior why is he the savior well some people figured it out that uh, these cheese, uh, cheap Chinese uh, USB DVB-T receiver dongles that look like, I have some here I guess, yes here, well, here is one for example, just like this, it's like you can buy it from eBay for 15 or 20 dollars, not that much. They have a, they have a real tech chip in them and this chip uh, can have, um, can be turned into kind of a debug mode in which mode he will, it will send uh, raw samples from the air through the USB interface, making it like a cheap uh, software-defined radio, because you will get samples from the air, which you can then process with your software running on the computer. So, and we have two different tuners in these, the E4000 and the RA20T, and uh, you can see that uh, for, for these tuners, we have a specific frequency range which these tuners are able to tune the chip. And, um, and for example, for GSM 900, both of these tuners are just fine. So we can use, use these really cheap dongles to let people, um, let people experience G, uh, GSM, maybe. And then, of course, there was the million dollar question, like, is the code which has already been released for USRP compatible with these uh, uh, dongles and the answer was yes and I was really really happy about this because now we have an intersection of both cheap hardware and code available but of course we cannot uh, release like an unlimited version of GSM crack or GSM sniffing to be to say it like that because uh, that wouldn't that would be really irresponsible so we have limitations, and these limitations are mainly because of the code, because the code was less, ma really not really good maintained, and um, no, not real development has been done for like two years, I, I would say. So we have we have the original limitations of the code, which are we have only downlink, which means only the signals that are coming from the tower to the phone are could be sniffed. We can only do like re real good sniffing on a non-hopping cell. In Hungary, we have quite a lot of these. Actually, two of the three operators which are actually uh, uh, operating networks are using non-hopping cells, and the third one I wasn't able to test yet because it uses the GSM, the other GSM frequency. And um, so that, that, that one, for example, in Hungary is not a problem to have a non-hopping cell. And then um, the radio needs some calibration because of the cheap hardware used. It's not so accurate, so we need to calibrate it a little bit to, to be as accurate as possible. So I would um, say that it's just enough limitations, what we have right here on the table, that it is safe to be released to the public and give it to everyone, but, and, and, uh, and it wouldn't probably harm much. 
but uh, it would be still fun to play, so people would be like interested in trying it out. So it's like it's still we have the intersection and the compromise, which I think is good. So just really quickly going through GSM because I haven't really got myself really into deep into the G, into GSM, and um, and also I know that some people might know a lot more about GSM than I do right now. So I would just really go to the um, the basics. So we have um, we have a, we have cells in in uh, GSM, and these cells are operating on on specific frequencies. And this frequency is also known as the absolute radio frequency channel number, or the ARFCN. So when you have a phone, like you have uh, uh, Blackberries, have these uh, so-called engineering uh, screens, in which you can read these the ARFCN number, or even iPhones have uh, such an engineering screen to put up the iOS people here. If anyone is cares about, I'm looking at Steph, <laughs> and then um, and then uh, once once you have this number, then uh, there is a small utility called the a ARFC and Calc, which will give you the actual frequency, like if it's in the GSM 900 band or if it's in the other GSM band and stuff like that. And uh, GSM consists of many, many channels, and um, and one of them is the so-called beacon channel, which which carries all the pagings and the system information. So information about the cell and information about like which uh, which mobile identity is being paged. Um, because GSM works on based on pagings, meaning that uh, if a mobile identity has to interact with the system, it will get paged. And then and there is also a traffic channel which actually carries the data, mainly the voice data. And to look a little bit more to the, into the structure, I have this uh, website pulled up here. So the data flies in GSM in uh, so-called time slots. So, and uh, you can see that each time slot has uh, 156.25 bits in it. That um, that's actually not all useful data. There's also a lot, a lot of signaling to to make it uh, resisting um, more, make it more resistant to to interference and and uh, other obstacles the radio waves might hit. And then one, the data what, which which is being sent in one time slot is called a burst. So the main uh, thing or the main main target in GSM sniffing is to get like raw bursts out of your radio device and then using those bursts to interpret those bursts and figure out what is going on in the network. So, and then I also put the link to this website into the presentation so you will be able to find it and, and look it up. It has uh, all the stuff in it that's actually quite good. It says GSM for dummies, but well, I, I, am, I am a dummy in GSM, so I think that was, that was quite appropriate for me. So what are the steps to crack GSM according to the 2011 uh, presentation? Well, the first step was to uncover the TIMZ or the temporary mobile subscriber identification. That is, that is an ID which, as the name suggests, should be temporary. And its main, um, main goal is to not have the uh, phone number traveling always through the air, but to have like a temporary ID which makes it impossible to like figure out, like locate people because if you would be able to uh, listen to the paging channel and then see all the phone numbers coming in, you would be able to tell that, okay, this certain phone number is actually connected to that specific cell, and that, that's, that's not, a, not a really good. So that's mainly why we have a, a Teams or so a temporary uh, identification. It should be like changing every single transaction to make it impossible to, to follow people, but um, in usually it changes like every 24 hours or, or every some hours on some networks. So the, the first step would be to uncover this identity. So you have a phone number and you would like to know what, what the Team Z currently is of that uh, specific uh, subscriber and then, then you would need to do, do some uh, steps which I will cover a little bit later. And the second step is to look at the data you were able to capture and, uh, and figure out the input for Kraken. We will talk a little bit about how that works. However, I'm not going, probably not going to present that for you today. And then cracking the key with, uh, using Kraken is also, also what's not going to be on the table. We're going to talk about how that works. And then in the end, when you have the key, uh, you need to use that key to decode the conversation which you sniffed. So the first step is uncovering a TIMSY 
and this has been covered uh, many, many times, especially it started in 25C3 with uh, talking about the HLR query. The HLR is, is, um, has all um, has uh, subscriber um, data in it, and what you can do is uh, query these uh, HLRs of, of specific operators to figure to actually locate your uh, target in in a country or in some countries you can even locate it to larger areas, and then and these these services are pretty much available almost for free or for for like pennies as as in some presentations it was presented. Um, to buy on online, and you can just put in the phone number and and get some some really raw data, so raw estimation of about the victim, and then the se the second step would be uh, using a silent SMS, and the main idea and the old technique behind uh, Timsey uncovering is that if you send uh, silent SMSs, for example, uh, then the victim phone will get paged, and if you look at the like, if you send a silent SMS in a specific rate or like like a specific frequency, I would say, and you would be able to see that the same Timsy is being paged in that specific frequency, so you will be able to determine which one is the Timsy. So based on paging, which is uh, which is public information because it's being broadcasted on the cell, you would be able to tell uh, the Timsy of your victim, and to do that. Um, I, I must tell you that my, my demos are not ready yet because they are mainly uh, pre being prepared for the Hacktivity conference which will be in two weeks, but I would like to already show you like how far this thing is. So what I did is um, I have a Android phone here that is running on Sanjian mode, uh, number 10 I guess, and then, and then um, I created a little program which is uh, Listening on a network interface, and then and um, if you give it a phone number, it will send a silent SMS to that specific phone number, and I will release that tool after Hacktivity, and I would also like to show it to you if it's if it got connected. I think it got. So if I just tell it into the phone, which has an IP address of I don't know what, but I will figure it out in a sec. Yeah, it's 192. That 168, that uh, 42, that 129, and the port is fixed on uh, 1337. And then, as you see, I, I'm, I'm in this uh, command line, and then it's called ping SMS. It's not 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 nothing really spe uh, special. And the only option it has, if you give it a number, it will send the silent SMS to it. So. This actually requires uh, having a root access on an Android phone, actually having CyanogenMod mod running, because this uh, application needs to be running like a system application, and it uses reflection to get into the uh, internal APIs of the phone app. And using those internal APIs, it is capable of doing, um, uh, of actually having the raw SMS byte array and performing operations on it before it gets sent by the by the um, baseband processor. So, and then uh, what my intentions are right now is to create a Python front end for this program, which would be running on the host computer, and that Python program would actually do uh, send these silent SMSs, SMS messages, and while doing that, it would listen to the network using an RTL SDR stick and see the paging channel and then figure it out, correlate the data and figure out the Timsy of the victim phone. So that's that, that what it would look like later when it's, it's ready. Okay, so the next step would be a data analysis and using Kraken. Uh, the idea of cracking GSM is pretty much based on that uh, it's a known plain text attack and how it works is that in GSM there is a lot of extra information and extra extra packets or bursts sent that are not really needed, and these are mainly system information or uh, uh, or other like controlling messages. And the interesting thing about this is, once the phone switches on encryption and starts ciphering, those messages will still be uh, sent to the phone. And then um, once you have a look at the network, you would be able to determine that okay, I have seen a system information message 
coming in and I know that on this specific network these system information messages are being sent like periodically. So if I look at the encrypted data I would be able to determine that okay this specific frame or burst actually contains a known plain text, actually contains the same system information data that I was able to capture. So what you see here is you send the same data encrypted and unencrypted on the network and it is, it is possible to determine in the encrypted data like which one is the one that uh, you are able to, you have already seen. So and then and the difference between the encrypted data and the non encrypted data is a simple XOR operation with a key stream. So what you do is you take the unencrypted version of the burst, XOR it with the, with the encrypted burst and then you will get key stream and this key stream could actually be uh, fed into Kraken which is the tool to crack a GSM uh, key stream. And then uh, Kraken uses a two terabytes of background um, information data, I would say. I already I have a, a two terabyte disk prepared with the data. Um, and I, I would be happy to share it with anyone if, if someone happened to have a two terabyte hard disk with himself here right now. But uh, what, we, what I already checked and tried was using cloud services for this because I don't think that many people would like to carry like a two terabyte hard disk with themselves. So I checked Windows Azure because I had some, some credit for that. And, and it's, pardon me? I can bring hard drives tomorrow if you like. All right, I mean, Ooh, I yeah. think we have a lot of them in stock, so if whoever wants a hard drive. Cool. Okay. I think you would, you would need to get um, some kind of uh, rack for it, like a USB or something, because I only have like one and it's already filled it with so. Um, but the but the uh, but the great idea behind um, actually going to the cloud was that uh, it's really cheap to get uh, get like terabytes terabytes of disks out to to Windows Azure uh, in, in Windows Azure. So you just you can just attach those disks and you have fast networking. So downloading the the Rainbow Tables is is quite fast too. And then um, I, I checked the speed of of using. Windows Azure for cracking uh, GSM keystream and uh, it was around like f uh, 50 or 60 seconds for, for one keystream. On my computer it, takes, it took around two minutes I would say. So it's, it's really, it's, it's faster and it's, it's probably cheaper on the, on the short run. And I also contacted uh, Maximal and Spike who is running cloudcracker.com to actually have GSM cracking in Cloudcracker for like, like some, some amount of money. And then he said, okay, that's cool. He needs to contact with his lawyer and then he actually disappeared. So I emailed him again and he said, well, we are still in negotiations, but he's really interested in about this thing. So one day it might be possible to have GSM in the, in, in the cloud as a cloud cracker service. I think that that would be ideal for, for people. But as already said, this will not be presented today, at least not here right now. I might be able to, to put it together later today during the party. And then uh, I was already said that um, uh, you, need to, you need to analyze the data and I already said things like you know that in, such, in, in a certain network you know that which uh, encrypted burst is the one that you already seen before. And um, to do that, you need to actually analyze the network first and then be able to, to do some cracking. And for analyzing, you need to see all the encrypted data too. So to, first of all, to analyze and analyze data, you need, you need to get the correct session key, which is stored in the SIM card. And this is the same key that you would be able to crack with Kraken later, but first you need to know what to put into Kraken when you would like to really like crack something. So to get the, get the session key, uh, you need to use, um, a, it, it could be extracted from the SIM card pretty easily. This is a, a smart card reader which is available online for, I don't know, 20 or $30. I just take it, took it apart to look it more cool. It looks more cool right there. And then what you can do is, is uh, get like a simple smart card or like a, a credit card or, or what you're not using and then uh, put in the SIM card like that. I, this, this one has already a fit for the SIM card and why? Yeah, the, actually the, it has, the duct tape has been flipped. All right, it's, it should be fine like that. Open the card like that and 
when it's done, then uh, you connect the reader. Okay, I might have to disconnect the phone, I'm sorry. And then once the reader is connected, there is a free utility online, which is called uh, SimSpy from a German guy. Uh, I'm not sure about his name, sadly, but we will see it. So if you start the Sims, uh, okay, it has been connected probably to the virtual machine. Okay, where are my removable devices? All right, it's still installing. Okay, yeah, Windows. Why? Why? Why would I thought that when I plugged it in, it's already working? It's not that like. Okay, come on. No, Windows update. Come on, don't do this to me. I'm not using that shit. <laughs> That's what it, no, all right, okay, well, okay. Why, why am I using Windows? That would be the first question. All right. It's not seeing the card. Okay, it, it's not, maybe this one. Insert a valid SIM, my, it is into. All right, here we go, here we go. And if I go to read card, and then go down a little bit. I'm not sure if you can see it. Here is the here, here is the ciphering key actually. This key is not available because because this is the SIM card I actually used on, on our own network and our own network does not have encryption enabled, so the SIM card does not have the encryption key in it. But here you would be able to see the actual KC. And then using that KC you would be able to actually decrypt data which you captured before and then um, and then analyze it and figure out how it works I, I, will, I will I will show it to you actually right now why don't we go back to my Ubuntu and see a little bit more okay okay let's exit out from this so what I have running here if I will find that terminal is yeah um, here I have Wireshark up and running, but that's already for another one. Let's let's continue again. So uh, what I'm doing here is um, I have a phone that is connected to commercial network, and I was able to figure out uh, the a ARFCN. So I used the ARFCN calc to actually uh, get the exact frequency uh, somewhere here. I will not be able to find anything because of these many terminals, but whatever. And then uh, what I do is just uh, run GSM receive uh, pi. That's actually included in, um, in GNU radio. So you just download GNU radio, install it, and it's pretty much ready to be used. And as you can see, it is, well, it's still trying to figure out the packets. When, when you have errors like that, it's probably that the uh, RTLS here was not able to sync to your um, sync to the channel good so we have lots of errors right there and if we wait a little bit it probably will warm up and be able to actually give us some valuable data and well it still takes some time so what I would like to do is um, not wait for this to actually uh, start up because it might take some minutes but I have some saved files and then uh, I can show you to you how that works. So once you were able to save all the data, you would need to use uh, GRC, which is also a, ut a free utility available to download, to actually uh, convert the data to a C file format. And once you have a C file format, then uh, you would be able to do, uh, you would be able to analyze it with the tool called AirProbe. And to use AirProbe, you just need to uh, specify the decimal rate which is 64 you need to specify the configuration and you need to give it a file so what is a configuration well it is uh, uh, pretty much one of these options um, I figured out that most of the operators at least here in Hungary are using the so-called combined configuration which has which means that also the as the CCH, which is the standalone dedicated controls, control channel, and also the uh, so the way GSM works is it has a control channel, and usually 
actually as what you would see is that the phone is sitting on the beacon channel and once it gets an, uh, uh, an instruction from the network to change, it will change to the control channel. On the control channel, the network will tell it like what is going on and then the phone would like switch to a traffic channel to receive or, or transmit traffic or go back to the beacon channel. But uh, most of the operators, at least what, which I have seen here in Hungary, using the so-called combined configuration, which means that also the control channel is the same channel as the beacon channel. And as you can see here, here the zero or the one or two, whatever, that's actually a time slot. And the beacon channel is, is always a time slot zero, if I'm, if I'm correct. So what we need to do now, we just would like to look at the data and then uh, see how it looks like and then um, so I would just give it 0C, which means um, uh, decode the data as, as a, a combined channel. And then, as you can see, we'll go through and it will print out uh, the bursts, actually. And if we go to Wireshark, we'll be able to see also the Ubuntu DNS queries. But if we go down a little bit, you can, we can see that uh, there were some paging requests. And if we open this up, uh, we can see all different uh, Timzy's and, and for example, here's a Timzy identity. And as you can see in this burst, we have uh, one, two, three, four Timzy's that, is being that are being paged. And, um, and we can go a little bit down. And what we see here is something interesting with what we look for. And this is a ciphering mode command. This tells the phone to actually switch on encryption. So we know that something happens right here, but we are not sure what. So um, if we would, be, we would already have information about the network, we might w be able to now use the known plain text attack and get the key stream and put it into Kraken and get the key back. But to speed things up, uh, I already have the key for this capture file. So let's just have a look at how this looks like if I give it a, a one more option, which is the key. So let's see the infos file. And here I have the key for this. Uh, C file, and let's give it this info, but I need to remove the spaces from it, and I will need to restart my Wireshark. Okay, and it decodes all the data, and if I go down a little bit, I will be able to see the SMS that actually went through the network. And it is uh, right here. So I will open it up for a little bit bigger. Here we go. And here is the data which I sent through the network. And, um, and I was able to capture it using only the RTL SDR. And then uh, crack the key, or not crack the key, but read, out, read the key. But it's pretty much almost the same, as, as I would say, from, from a point of view. And then read the SMS I had. And then, one more thing which I would like to present. Thank you, Chef. That was really nice. Uh, one more. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. And the one more thing was, uh, many people kept ta uh, telling me that, all right, you can get an SMS, but that's like one, one chunk of data, like a really small chunk of data. And the RTLS, you wouldn't be able to handle like a whole conversation or like a phone call at least the downlink part of it, because that's the only part we can understand, why we can uh, decode with the, with the code. And I thought, why wouldn't I give it a try? So I have another C file that's actually containing a whole call. And I will just decode it right now. OK, that wasn't the one. <laughs> yes, you, I decoded it like that. You know, like in the matrix. I, can, I cannot see the code. I can only see plants. And <laughs> Okay, so let's decode this file again with the 64 decimation rate. That's, that's the rate of the RTL SDR. And, um, and let's first have a look at the, why don't, well, let's have a look at the control channel first. And then, yeah, let's use the key now. But I need the file name too, which was called that C file. And restarting the Wireshark, here we go. It will take some time because that's a much bigger file, naturally. I think it has like uh, something around 1,600 packets. So as you can see, it's now at 200. 
so we will need to wait a little bit until it finishes. And once it's done, we will be able to see that the phone has gets the ciphering mode command, but uh, after that there is uh, another command which called immediate assignment, and that one is the one that actually says, tells the phone that now you need to switch to a traffic channel because you are going to be uh, doing some, uh, do, you are going to be transmitting traffic. As you can see, I already have data coming in. And since I already gave it the key, we will not be able to see the uh, this, the uh, ciphering mode command because that one is, is uh, um, not here right now because we have the key. So once we go, we will need to wait, I think, a little bit more. Yeah, my computer is just running hot right now. It takes quite some computing power to get these samples, but Okay, let's go down and I will just sort by, okay, stop it and sort it by info. And then, yeah, we have a lot of immediate assignment. There was quite some buzz going around in this cell. I hope I will be able to find the one I'm looking for. Well, since I know the Timzy, I will be able to show you the Timzy. I mean, I will be able to show you this, uh, the immediate assignment, hopefully. Call that infos. And then let's search for that Teams in Wireshark. Yeah. Okay, that's not how it should work. Here we go. It should be a hex. Well, it should be a string, actually. But that's not the one. Or is it? Oh, wow. I just lost my item. Okay, here we go. That's, what, that's the one. Okay, let's find that one. What? Did I copy the key? Please tell me I... Okay, I probably did. You didn't tell me. You let me do the wrong thing. Why am I using GUI? That's the second question, I guess. No, why does X have two clipboards? That's the good question. <laughs> <laughs> Four clipboards should be on there. Yeah, go for X value. Should that work? It's not, not really the one I'm looking for. Why? Maybe, but it should be, well, that's a really long file. Oh, wait, have a look at the immediate assignment. Most of these actually are quite the same to tell you, and most of them just tell you the go to time slot number one, but sometimes they give you like go to time slot number six to use that for, for your uh, stuff. But this one actually does not have anything. It says page mode, blah, 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 what? Dedicated mode, there is nothing. It says, okay, this time slot six, let's go down. It should be six. This one does not have anything. I think that's, that might be the one. No. Okay. All right. I'm kind of lost in it, but what I'm going to try is, um, I actually have the, I actually have the call file here, but I'm not able to, dec well, let's try one more thing. Let's try to, uh, decode this, let's say the first time slot, and then TS a traffic channel, and then let's go for it. Let's see if that works out. It doesn't look that good. Well, that's the beginning of it. And let's see if it works, maybe. And that doesn't look good. It cannot understand anything, because that's why it's giving, you the, uh, giving me the parity errors. Okay, here we go. Okay, that's the one, I guess, because that's, that seems to be good data. That's right, okay. Yeah, it might work, actually. It seems... I guess, I guess. It, she might be. She might be a brunette. I'm not sure. I'm, I still have to look at it a little bit. What's your type? It's, it's definitely your type, Dina. I, I can tell you that. <laughs> Watch out, maybe someone else is watching this video. <laughs> All right, 
it's it's done and it's out. So where is my output file? Okay. And I screwed it up again. Wow, isn't that amazing? Because in Hungary we have uh, uh, the, these, this, um, this operator actually uses a different configuration, which is not even listed here in the wiki. It's not listed pretty much anywhere, but actually it is listed in the code. And I remember that I was able to find, figure it out. And um, I don't, I, my history is not there yet. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think I deleted all the history, but I have, I have the actual file, so uh, I will plug in audio for you. If I have it here, I want I want to give Dinat an opportunity too. So I'm just gonna play the CVLC. There we go, and then it's called 2013 and seven and seven. Yeah, it was one in the morning when I was able to record this, and when it starts, is it playing? No, it's not yet. I think if my laptop is muted again, that's awesome. Here we go. And let's try it now. And now this one is muted. <laughs> oh, okay, let's try it again now. No, wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> okay. You see? Okay, good. You know what? It's going to work now. There we go. Welcome to the Redstone Passport information line. For information about Redstone Passport, press 1. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. For information about Redstone Passport, press 1. Or to add Redstone Passport to your price plan, press 2. Redstone Passport can be used in Albania, Andorra, Australia, Austria, Belgium, I'd like you to go to Hungary Bulgaria, and then stop the capture. Bulgaria. Canary Islands, Caroline, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Faroe, Finland, France, Germany, Gibraltar, Greece, Hungary, Iceland. And that's the end. Um, so, downlink. Downlink sniffing accomplished using RTL SDR. And um, as you can hear it, I think the voice quality is, is good. I think you can understand all the words. Well, uplink is not there yet, and it's probably not going to be there because of some limitations. But uh, downlink is possible. So what, what I would like to tell you in the end, like what, what can actually an attacker achieve using this? Well. Uh, right now, we have a platform that is cheap, that is uh, really easy to set up, I would say, because even I was able to do it, so it's quite easy to set it up. And um, using this setup, you can actually uh, crack a GSM session key for a certain user. And then once you have that key, uh, these keys are recycled. Uh, pretty much. Not always. For example, some operators change it by every call, but uh, some operators do like you, ch they change it every single time when uh, there is a new call, but they don't change it for SMS messages. So once you have recovered the key, one, uh, till there is no new call for that specific subscriber, you can read all the text messages. And what I would like to do personally is combine it together with the a new attack that was shown by the last. Uh, uh, C3 conference by Nico Golda, and the whole idea behind this his attack is a paging attack, which is, as you know, pagings are uh, public information. So if you have like an Osmo Com BB phone, and that actually is able to do anything what you want, so you can tell it to respond to any kind of paging. So you respond to a paging that was not supposed to be going to you, but to an actual customer or subscriber. So you respond uh, respond to that paging and then kind of hijack the session of that specific uh, customer, uh, I mean uh, subscriber, if you want to go to the HTTP word. So you are able to hijack the session, and then since you, have, you are able to correct the key, you would be able to actually do a transaction using that key. So the whole purpose for an attacker would be like, we have a banking system, and then 
the attacker has the password, but uh, there is a one-time password which is being sent in SMS. Using this attack, the attacker can uh, ask for the, uh, uh, the SMS, and the SMS would not even be delivered to the victim. It would be hijacked and delivered to this single phone, so the victim wouldn't know anything about it. It's a lot better than sniffing down the SMS and then cracking the key and then, uh, and then uh, using that key, because then the victim would say, okay, I got an SMS. But here, the victim does not get an SMS at all about this. And also, if you do transactions like, like the attacker stole the credit card and you get SMS about every single credit card transaction, these could be all rerouted, so to say, or hijacked, and the victim would not know anything about it. You just need to be uh, not even in the same cell, as far as I know, but uh, you just need to be in the same location area, which is quite big. So as Nico showed in the presentation in Berlin, they have like three of those which means you can be pretty much on the other side of Berlin, but still be able to affect people. And that's what would be kind of interesting, I guess. So I would like to give a big thanks to all these people listed here. Uh, Vorex and KO, which and they created uh, an Android uh, program which was able to, to do uh, spe special SMSs, and I was able to modify that code to, to be able to send silent messages. I would like to thank DNet for the NFC CAT application, which actually I shamelessly copied all the networking part of it because the, it's the same way how my, my application works. And then SR Labs and Karsten all and definitely all the people. I would not like to talk only about Karsten because there is a lot of people behind him doing all the hard work too. So I would like to say Asha Labs and the whole team, uh, I would like to see, give a big thank you. Pardon me? Harald Werther, definitely, definitely. Absolutely, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I will put him in there right now. You know what, I'm right now, here. And then Frank A. Stevenson for creating Kraken and the RTLSGR.com blog, which uh, actually give a little bit uh, sh um, a tutorial about how to receive GSM signals. Nico Golde for his help with the paging attack and also for your attention. So that was me about GSM, and now it's time for Q&A. If there is anyone. Yes. Well, maybe uh, I, I can bring some hard drives tomorrow in a copy station so if anyone, I don't know how many of them I should probably bring, but uh, we could duplicate the rainbow tables for people who are interested in the room. That's, that's really good. I will thank you for that contribution in the name of the community. Okay, so I will just need to say that's my PGP, so yeah, that's my PGP. Okay, that's fine. Thank you for... <laughs>